Um, good afternoon, everyone. A, a pleasure to be here, um, uh, as always. Um, when Jamie and I uh, reached out to John to see if uh, he'd be willing to be with us this afternoon, um, I think it was fair to say that the Montgomery Conference was not something that was on your radar or you are aware of. And I, here you are. What do you I, think? I have been blown away. I walked in yesterday afternoon to the women's event, and the room was loaded with all these female entrepreneurs, and I'm like, wow, is that cool? And just the content today has been equally cool. So, Jamie, my hat's off to you for a job well done. Okay, so, look, you didn't come here for this kind of fluff talk, right? You want to get into <laughs> it, right? So, John, you deal with extraordinary egos. You deal with deep controversy. Yeah, I got you right here next to me. That's right. <laughs> You deal with controversy, you deal with divisiveness, so let's get to the heart of this. Are the Warriors going to win this championship Damn right. or not? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I used to be a minority owner in the Warriors, and one of the most or least rewarding experiences of my life is being a minority owner in an NBA franchise. Uh, you have no say whatsoever. And the classic example of that was our team had not made the playoffs in 12 years. And we finally made the playoffs. And in the first round of the playoffs, we were seated number eight, and Dallas was seated number one. And sure enough, we kicked their butt. And then we go and we get beat by Utah, and we're out in the second round. So season's over. The majority owner decides, let's dismantle the team. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he says, shut up. If I wanted your advice, I would ask for it. That went down well. And that was when I realized that there was a process in the NBA that was a little different than a collaborative, constructive, let's do this together process. And that's why I did not roll my investment into the new warrior ownership. But the team's doing well. I hope. KD gets back, because uh, if he does, we've got a shot. But Cleveland is doing very, very well, and they have really, really built their team. They've made some additions that should give them a, a really, really good shot at the championship again this year. You know I'm British, right? I, I couldn't tell. Yeah. I thought you were Australian. It's my accent, right? <laughs> Are you impressed I knew that was a basketball team? Uh, well, you've been living here in L.A. long enough. I'm surprised you know anything other than the Lakers. Uh, yeah, this is true. Yeah, go Lakers. See, I've adapted already. Um, so, John, here we are. So, seriously, um, I mean, your, your career is extraordinary. I had the pleasure and honor of working for you when we were both at Symantec. Um, why don't you give us a sense of, of uh, maybe the journey and maybe the start in IBM and just, you know, as you sit here, you know, thinking about yourself and your view of yourself maybe at 25, would this have been a possible even dream? Hmm. Well, I went to a historically black college in Tallahassee, Florida, called Florida and M University, and they're both here. <laughs> and in my last two years of college, I sold stereo equipment, and I had a family, and I sold stereo equipment because I need, needed a job, I needed to have family income. And lo and behold, one day IBM was coming on campus to recruit salespeople. And the guy who was the head of college outplacement services called me and said, John, you should come and do an interview with IBM. And I said, you mean IBM, the computer company? He said, yep, the computer company. I said, well, look at me. I've got a 800-pound afro. Oh. I've got a big mustache and beard. Uh, I wear striped pants and flower shirts and two-tone shoes. Does that look like an IBMer? I said, I'm, I'm not sure I could ever adjust to become a part of that company. He says, I don't care. Go. So I go on the interview, and as luck would have it, the local sales manager, what IBM called the marketing manager, was looking to buy a stereo system. <laughs> and I spent the majority of the interview trying to convince him that he should buy from me my store right there in downtown Tallahassee. And that led to, obviously, them making me a job offer. 
And I thought, well, gee, I'll do this for a couple of years and I'll go back to law school, which is what I really wanted to do. Because back in those days in the African-American community, success professionally was a teacher, a preacher, a doctor, or a lawyer, or a local businessman. And I knew I couldn't be one or two of those first group, but I thought, being a lawyer, I could kind of dupe people all the time and, and do okay. And sure enough, a uh, year and a half in, I sat down with my father-in-law, who was an attorney, and he convinced me that you don't really want to do that. You ought to stay where you are. And fortunately, I had my first mentor that came about at that moment in time, because IBM's training program in those days, literally, from new hire to your first quota was 18 months. Wow. You spent 18 months learning to be a sales rep. And I had a horrible experience during that 18 month period where a client said to a rep that I was with, don't ever bring him back here again. And it was about the color the of my skin, adversity. not whether or not I was affecting sales there. So IBM literally advanced my career by almost five years because the tradition was you would sell new accounts, then mid-sized accounts, and then large accounts. And lo and behold, I went from new hire trainee the large accounts like that. And my first mentor was a guy named Dick Lemon. And Dick was this big, gregarious, jovial, wonderful guy, drove a Jaguar and a convertible Cutlass. I'm like, man, this guy is it. <laughs> and he had a money clip that was the biggest piece of gold I'd ever seen in my life. And I'm like, shit, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> and he said to me after about a week, Get this, don't be offended. Stick with me, kid. I'm going to have you farting through silk underwear. I have never heard you use that phrase before. <laughs> His whole idea was, I can teach you how to be a successful sales rep. And sure enough, those three years in the territory with Dick were truly, truly formative. So, so just tell us a little bit how your, how your career then developed at IBM, because you, you ended up, I think, at head office, right? You ended up in the main building. Was that difficult as an African-American in that time? Or was IBM progressive in those moments? Well, IBM had a policy back then that was very progressive, which is you will do business with our rep. And if you don't want to do business with our rep, we don't want to do business with you. And ironically enough, that experience played itself through for me as I progressed in my career. Not that many customers said they want, didn't want to do business with me, but people knew that IBM was firm in its belief that it needed to have a diverse workforce, and I represented one of them. I was fortunate enough to have early experiences everywhere. The thing that I didn't learn until later in life was the need to really assimilate into the culture. I fought being an IBMer. I didn't want to wear a blue suit. I didn't want to not have an afro. I did not want to shave off my mustache. As a matter of fact, I was proud of the fact that I wore two sister suits, Polly and Esther. <laughs> and they were any color but blue, because I just didn't believe in that. But the people believed enough in me that they were willing to put up with my foolishness and about five years into my career, I woke up one day and realized I look different than everybody else here. And it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. It was all about how I dressed, how I prepared myself to go to work every day. And then I converted and became a Brooks Brothers model, and the rest is history. Exactly. <laughs> and you do look fabulous. <laughs> um, so so let's, let's shoot forward a little bit to um, when I started to get to know you at Symantec. And, and Look, one of the things that was very clear to me um, in, in the time that I was at Symantec was, was that John was incredibly capable of diagnosis, developing strategy, resourcing that strategy, aligning the company, and executing. And you, you, know, you took the business from a $600 million business to a $6 billion business at a time when Symantec needed leadership. How good was that time? Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, it was probably, no, not probably, it was the most exciting period of my 46-year career. I mean, it's just been phenomenal. Um, I'll never forget 
having recognized that I was never going to be the CEO of IBM. And I believed that if I was going to be a CEO, I had to get that job before I was 50 years old. And I was announced as the CEO 10 days before my 50th birthday. And I knew that I was going to have to run really, really hard to make sure that it wasn't one of those where they said, oh, they, they just did that because Jesse Jackson was in town and they needed to have an African-American in a tech company and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I woke up one morning and realized, my gosh, something is wrong here. This is a tech company that is not about technology, but is about distribution. They were more focused on how they distributed their products than what products they built. And so if you were to ask anyone in the company at that point, what is the centering point of your technology portfolio? They couldn't answer it. Yeah. And so it just so happened that the hot thing right there at that moment in time was security. And we had one of the hot young brands in Norton Antivirus. And I decided, OK, that's it. We're going to center our business around security, not antivirus, but security. And we're going to move from distributing any product that we can in a yellow box to really, really going deep in security. And we bought a little, first little company was called UR Labs for UR filtering. And next we bought an a enterprise company called Accent Technologies. And then from there, we really did start to scale the business. And our security business grew from about 300 million or so when I got there to about almost 3 billion by 2005. And then we bought Veritas, and oh. man, what a tough ride that was. I, I was just about to go there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it always felt like the logic for the acquisition based on the conditions that surrounded that, us at that time was sound. But it, it just never gelled, right? I, I, what learnings from that moment? It was the biggest software acquisition of its time. It was like 13 billion, right? Well, it was announced at 13 billion, but our stock cratered. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the actual close price was closer to 10. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the real issue that I didn't recognize at the time was the cultural mismatch between the two companies. And you can't take two organizations that are, pick it, six, 7,000 people big each and integrate them when they are so radically different in the way they think and behave. Uh, I ended up ultimately having to fire almost every one of the executives that joined us from Veritas because they just could not accept and become a part of the semantic culture. And we spent three years trying to get that right. And that's when I then turned it over to Enrique and said, okay, now here are the things that you need to do. But while Many people argue it wasn't a good fit. If you secure data on one side and recover data on the other side, why is that not a good match? And so I don't think the strategy was necessarily flawed. Our execution was truly, truly flawed. And the execution errors were more around cultural and people integration than anything else. Yeah. It, look, you will always be known, I think, for turning semantic around. and and. Soon after you left Semantic, I mean, many people would have hung their boots up, right, and said, look, uh, the success was there. But then you went on and you became an entrepreneur. And you became the CEO of Virtual Instruments. Just give us a little bit of how that happened and then maybe the story of that uh, moment. Yeah, well, the transition plan out of Symantec was to become an early stage technology investor. And I had invested in, at that point in oh, early 09, about a half a dozen little companies, one of which was Virtual Instruments. And by 2010, a year after I had departed, um, the company hit a little bump in the road and I went in along with another board member to try to figure out what had happened and why did it happen and why do we, how do we change that? Only to discover that we collectively agreed that the problem was our CEO, that he had to go. And so I turned to Steve, uh, my cohort, and said, okay, I want you to run this place. And then discovered that his wife was ill and having some problems medically and had to go through surgery and what have you. And he could not do it because he had two young kids. So I decided, OK, I'll run it for a few months, and then we'll find a new CEO, and we'll get on with it. 
Well, on day two on the job, I had the discovery of my life. We had no cash. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than trying to run a company with no cash. So we all dug in our pockets, put another five and a half million dollars into the company. We thought that that would allow us to run for about three, maybe four quarters. And if we had one or two good quarters during that period of time, we would use that as the platform to go truly capitalize the company the right way. Well, as luck would have it, that first quarter, June of 2010, we had an awesome quarter. Um, I leaned on my good buddy John Donahoe at eBay. Uh, we got $2.8 million worth of business out of eBay that quarter alone. Uh, the last quarter, we had only done 900000 We did over $6 million that quarter. And I said, this is the time to go raise money. And so I went out to raise money because I'm fighting for this company. And lo and behold, we raised $22.5 million. And then I realized, holy smokes, I'm stuck. I got to stay because I can't very well walk out on the people who have now invested in this company. And so I stayed until we ran out of money again. <laughs> How did that feel? Uh, like something that starts with an S and ends in a T. Did you see it coming? Um, yes, I saw it coming, but I had a different impression of what might happen because I had been an investor in the company for a very long time and I felt that it was a cohort of guys around the table, I assumed they had my back. And what I didn't realize was that as we brought in two or three new investors to the group, that changed the dynamic in the room. And the conversation went, because I went to them and said, we have to run this business not simply for growth, but for cash flow break even or better because that way we are conserving cash and we're managing growth at the same time. The transaction or discussion that occurred between the board was we're either all in or we're all out. And one guy raised his hand and says, I'm out, which meant the whole thing collapsed. And then I spent the balance of my time there, about six months, going from 300 people to 120 people. Uh, finding a soft landing for our customers. We had some of the most prestigious Global 1000 customers around the world. It was just incredible. And I did not want to walk away from either the team that was left or the customers that we had created. So we found a private equity, small tier two, tier three private equity firm, and we put it in their hands. They merged it with one of their portfolio companies, and now the company's doing okay. I mean, they're not growing like we used to, but they're not struggling for cash either. I think it's right that during that period, you had also been invited onto the board of Microsoft, or before then, and you were in fact transitioning to become the chairman of the board of Microsoft. Was that a surprise to you? Is that something that you wanted? Yeah, I mean, no one, no one could have ever told me in my life that I was going to be on the Microsoft board, much less be the chairman of the board. But one of my good friends was on the Microsoft board. His name was Jim Cash. And for any of you who went to Harvard in the 80s and 90s, Jim taught almost anybody that went through the Harvard Business School IT. And he was on the Microsoft board. He was on the Walmart board. He was on the GE board. I mean, a really, really incredible guy. And the day I announced that I was stepping down as CEO at Symantec, Jim called. And I said, Jim, you may not view us as a competitor, but we view you as a competitor. And so I can't very well join the Microsoft board. And he says, well, how long are you going to be chairman? I said, well, probably another year. He says, fine, I'll call you back. And sure enough, like clockwork, a year later, he calls back. I said, well, new deal. I'm going to stay another year. He says, OK, I'll call you back. And this time, six months later, he called back. And then a few days after that, Steve Ballmer called. And before too long, it started to take on an aura where I said, you know, forget about the fact that I've competed against these guys forever, dating back to my days in IBM. There's something about this company that is iconic. And there's something about this company that reminds me of IBM circa early 1990s when Lou Gerstner came in to yep. transform IBM. And I thought since I'd spent six years under the Gerstner regime, there was an opportunity for me to hopefully apply some of what I'd learned there to help Steve and the team transform the company. And so that's when I agreed to say yes. But I wanted to get enough 
time between my last stance on the board at Symantec and my first board meeting at Microsoft. So I didn't really join the board until March of 2012. Dave Marquardt was on the board at the time. Um, and I never would have expected the evolution to occur that did occur. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. I think this is a, a, an area of great fascination. I mean, my 20-something son you know, says to me occasionally how cool Microsoft is. And I think yeah. that there's plenty of people in the room that you know, in 10, 20 years to, you know, ago you know, didn't have that feeling about Microsoft. I think the second thing is the sense of openness and inclusiveness that's, that's happened. And you led the change of CEO. And I, I mean, led the search the for search. the new CEO. Right. What, could you tell us a little bit about how Sasha got the job and your view now of what he's done for Microsoft? Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that there was a natural bias amongst the board for an outsider, not an yeah. insider. Uh, primarily because the view was we needed fresh eyes and ears looking at this massive company and someone who could bring in a different cultural dimension or point of view than an insider might have. And after months and months and months of working the outside market, it was clear that a lot of the people we were interested in weren't that interested in us. And it was equally clear that we had about two to three, maybe four years, to make some really, really, really important technology decisions that would impact Microsoft 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And so to have someone who didn't know anything about technology, someone who knew a lot about cars yeah. or whatever the world might have been, um, we viewed that that's probably not the right person to put in the job. So that forced us to look inside. And there were two top candidates inside and Sasha Mer you know, really rose to the top amongst those two, in large part, one, because he truly was a technologist. He'd spent 22 years at Microsoft at that point and had been in all of the major enterprise businesses within Microsoft, including, not enterprise, the search business. And so the view was, let's make sure you know, we understand where he is culturally wise or on the cultural change issue. And so I spent a lot of time with Sasha and recognized that he's a different guy than the founders of this company. Was there a cultural issue? Oh, sure. Um, the culture of Microsoft used to be, if you were the smartest person in the room, you could be the rudest and crudest person in the room and get away with it. And oh, by the way, um, it was a hub and spoke model where you and I may have had similar jobs, but you didn't have to talk to me. You only had to talk to Steve or Bill. And so the sharing, the horizontal nature of how a big company like that should work just did not work at Microsoft at that period of time. And even Steve recognized that, and he had announced prior to his decision to, to retire something called One Microsoft, which was the notion that we're going to be much more horizontal in the way we think and behave. But someone like Sasha who was not a founder, who had been there for a long time, who understood the technology and understood some of the cultural gaps that they had, he turned out and has proven to be the ideal new CEO for Microsoft. We've got a short amount of time left. We've got a very short amount of time left. I have, uh, I have Jamie giving me that uh, number. I'm sorry, we've been talking for uh, let's, just, let's just wrap up, if I may, Jamie, with just 30 seconds. It would be remiss of us just not ask just one, one more major question, and that is, in this day and age, what's happening at the moment, everybody knows about, is there is some concern about, for example, the HB1 visa and immigration. Just give us just 20 seconds, 30 seconds on your view of that, and then we'll draw it to a close as required. Well, it's, it's quite disturbing to me that our country that has been focused on a level of inclusiveness um, has its number one spokesperson saying, nope, we don't want to be that inclusive. It's equally frustrating for me to think that an industry that is so dependent upon talent could find itself in a position where we don't have access to the talent 
and in a marketplace where, candidly, our school system has gone from first to worst. And, and so we have got to solve this H-1B problem. Now, ironically enough, one of the subtleties of what the administration has suggested is they will potentially stop all of the non-U.S. companies that are hogging the H-1B visas. And therefore, that suggests that maybe companies like Microsoft and Facebook and Google and many of you in this room will have access to more of that talent than Infosys and a lot of the Indian um, services companies. If that becomes the outcome, that would be good for the industry. But there are so many unknowns right now with this administration, not just around immigration, but around just financial matters in general. Lastly, because I want to end on a positive note, just even shorter, just your view of the future and how you feel your positivity for the world of innovation that we live in. Well, no one could have ever told me 46 years ago that this industry would have had the kind of impact it's had on our society. Not our country, but our society. And guess what? The rate and pace of technology change continues to accelerate. And so 15 years from now, we will be further along than we achieved in the last 46. I'm convinced of that. John, it's a pleasure to be with you as ever. And thank we'll you so much you. for sharing this with your audience. Thanks, Tom. Thank